I'm Connie Llewellyn, the adjunct curator here at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, and I'm very happy to welcome you today to our program this afternoon in conjunction with our show, Martin Wong, Human Instamatic. The exhibition, which will be on view through December 10th, originated at the Bronx Museum of the Arts. Sadly, its longtime director, Holly Block, passed away yesterday. Holly was a fierce champion of artists, especially artists of color like Martin Wong. We are here today to celebrate his work. The exhibition was curated by the Bronx Museum Director of Curatorial Programs, Antonio Sergio Bessa, who we're happy to have with us today, and also adjunct curator Yasmin Ramirez, and I was in charge of the Berkeley presentation, which was a great pleasure. I'd like to thank Assistant Curator Stephanie Canizzo for her invaluable help, as always, and Education Director Sherry Goodman for organizing all of the programs associated with the show. And on behalf of the museum, I also want to express our gratitude to the Andy Warhol Foundation, the Henry Luce Foundation, the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, Florence Fong Fai, and the Martin Wong Foundation, along with others who help support the show. In addition to Sergio Bessa, our presenters today are Marcy Kwan and Charlie Ahern. They will be introduced by our moderator, Mark Johnson. Mark is professor of art at SF State, where he also directs the gallery and has organized numerous important exhibitions, which from the start he saw as a way to research and present Asian American art history. One of his first shows was With New Eyes Towards an Asian American History in the Western United States, whose opening Martin Wong attended. He is the editor of the major anthology Asian American Art, 1850 to 1970, which was published by Stanford University Press in 2008, and curator of the 2004 exhibition Taiping Tianguo, Martin Wong's Utopia at the Chinese Historical Society of America. I should also add that Mark reserved, received his MFA in art here at UC Berkeley. Before turning the program over to Mark, I'd like to mention other events complementing the show. A panel discussion will take place November 11th at 1 in this room. It will focus on Martin Wong's time in New York and features panelists from the East Coast who knew him. On Saturday, December 9th at 3.30, deaf artist David Call will address the use of American Sign Language and the art of, in the art of several deaf, deaf artists, including his own and, of course, in the work of Martin Wong. And on most Wednesdays at 12.15 and Sundays at 2, graduate students from the Departments of Art History and Ethnic Studies will offer guided tours. Now, let's welcome Mark Johnson. Thank you. I'm uh, deeply honored to introduce today's speakers and uh, sort of set the stage for today's program, a round table discussion about Martin Wong's early and late life in San Francisco. At the outset, I would like to applaud the Berkeley Art Museum for presenting the exhibition and for its concurrent display of works by Miyoko Ito, who was born in Berkeley interned at Topaz before relocating to Chicago where she made her career. This makes for an important opportunity to consider Asian American art history. And of course, with the upcoming exhibition of Chung Ho Shu, there are even more resonances at the museum. I want to recognize Martin's loyal friend, Larry Rinder, for helping bring the exhibition that was so beautifully curated by Sergio Bessa to the museum. Uh, and I also want to thank Berkeley's curatorial treasurer, Connie Llewellyn, who has supervised the installation here, and the museum's dynamic director of education, Sherry Goodman. We are blessed with a dynamic quartet of speakers today. I'm very honored again to be able to share the stage with all of them. I'd like to dedicate my own opening remarks to the memory of Mike Moe, Martin Wong's first cousin, who died suddenly on August 18th of this year. Martin was an excuse me, Mike was an attorney, and it was he who set up the bylaws for the Martin Wong Foundation in 2003 with monies from Martin's own estate and donations from the family. How many people in the room knew Martin Wong? That's pretty good. Happy uh, to see some hands raised. 
for those of you who didn't, you're going to learn a little bit more about him today. He is, of course, best known for his gritty brick paintings of scenes from New York's Lower East Side. But the theme of today's panel will be the artist deep, artist's deep roots in San Francisco and Northern California. And those are much less well known. Martin was a voracious genius. He was Chinese American and gay and searched out and plunged himself into various subcultures throughout his life. He liked to say he was raised at the epicenter of the beat movement in North Beach. He attended George Washington High School in San Francisco and his class just celebrated their 50th high school reunion, sadly without Martin, as he died in 1999 at age 53. In this image on the screen, we see Martin's painting of his own parents floating above Chinatown in an Art Deco style of Tamara de Lempiska. And here are the four characters, Tai, Ping, Tian, Guo, floating overhead. These four characters are a double-edged poetic allusion to a mid-19th century conflicted utopian polarity that brought so many Chinese to California's mythical gold mountain, but also in, ended in the murder of millions and millions of Chinese during the Taiping Rebellion of the mid-19th century. Martin moved to Northwestern California in 1964 to attend Humboldt State University where he studied ceramics. He was influenced by his love for the work of self-taught Eureka artist Romano Gabriel. He even convinced his parents to purchase Romano Gabriel's home in Eureka, although the elaborate folk art carving was claimed and removed by the city of Eureka before they claimed ownership. This helps explain why Martin often described himself as self-taught, even though, of course, he had a college degree in art. Several Humboldt faculty during that time were proponents of a quirky personal aesthetic, and they included Jim Nutt, Gladys Nielsen, Deborah Butterfield, and John Buck. Wong Ceramics classmates at Humboldt were Michael Lucero and John Roloff. His ceramic work at Humboldt was often sculptural, and he created a, a distinctive series of abstract anal mandalas he called love letter incinerators. He transferred to UC Berkeley in 1966 to pursue architecture, but then dropped out after a semester and found himself taking acid and writing poems in San Francisco during the summer of love, although he eventually returned to Humboldt to complete his BA there. This slide shows Martin's self-published book of poems from the late 1960s on the left. Some of you are aware that Martin was a collector of everything from racist curios and tchotchke salt and pepper shakers, from original graffiti art to fine art by Mondrian and Andy Warhol, Japanese ukiyo-e prints and Chinese ink paintings. The Chinese calligraphy that appears second from the left is a scroll painted in 1802 from Martin's personal collection, inscribed with a poem from the Ming Dynasty. On the right is one of Martin's original poem scrolls, entitled Scary Night, a hallucinogenic chapter 11, he called it from his Das Puke book, that tells the story of the relationship between Vincent van Gogh and Paul Gauguin. Art Nouveau calligraphy was popular in the 1960s in Northern California, as was handmade jewelry. The second image from the right is a p one of Martin's poems incised on a pendant that resembles a military dog tag. This is a reminder that Martin grew up against the backdrop of the Vietnam War. Several of his good friends were drafted into the mil military. One close friend was killed in Vietnam while serving there. Our first speaker after I finish my remarks, will be Sergio Bessa, who is the organizing curator of the critically acclaimed Human Instamatic at the Bronx Museum. Today, Sergio will be speaking about Martin's poetry. I believe this is the first time any scholar has addressed Martin's poetry, and I very much look forward to his presentation. But I also want to say that Sergio's essay in the exhibition catalog about the shift in Martin's own sexuality and in American sexualities more generally that transpired during Martin's lifetime is absolutely fantastic, and I hope everyone will buy the catalog to read the essay. Sergio holds a PhD from NYU and is a scholar of concrete poetry. 
Martin was drawn to the gender-bending performance troops of the Coquettes and especially the Angels of Light, beginning in 1970. He photographed and painted the Angels' Easter 1971 Passion at Land's End where Hibiscus was crucified. Martin later worked with the Angels of Light as a set and poster designer for their elaborate musicals, often with spectacular costumes designed by Beaver Bauer and dazzling choreography by Rodney Price, the spirit of which can be sensed in this photograph from Martin's archive of a 1975 performance, uh, Parasites of the Bourgeois Sea. I've also dropped in an image of Martin's own resume consume, which is filled with inaccuracies. For example, he worked with the Angels of Light until at least 1975, as you see in the image on the right. Um, and he did not attend UC Berkeley for two years, as he writes, uh, as he writes here. During my first conversation with Martin more than 30 years ago, he told me a long and elaborate story about the terrible drowning of Chinese railroad workers during the 19th century, who he said were dragged out to sea on a raft made of redwood logs that resembled Jericho's raft of the Medusa and then cut adrift, and they were never heard from again. That story was totally fabricated. It was an exaggeration of a different, although still horrific, 1885 expulsion of 290 Chinese men and 20 Chinese women from Eureka on two steamers to San Francisco. It serves as a reminder for all of us that Martin was fond of saying, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. Today, our second speaker will be Julia Bryan Wilson from the Department of Art History at the University of California, Berkeley. She received her doctorate from Berkeley and is the author of the book, Art Workers, Radical Presence in the Vietnam War Era. I believe she will be speaking about the visionary art, fashion, and costumes from the Coquettes and Angels of Light during this revolutionary period. Martin's California work was informed by the psychedelic mood in the air during 1970s San Francisco and his own interest in esoteric Tibetan Buddhist art, Balinese Hindu art, and more. Examples of his blending of psychedelic and Tibetan references include his peacock tail costume for hibiscus from the 1972 Angels performance at San Francisco Poets Theater, and the watermelon wings that encircle his Tibetan porky pig with necklace and frame of Tibetan skull prayer beads. Martin returned to this iconography for one of his very last paintings, created in 1998 and painted in the basement of his parents' house in San Francisco. In this image with the blue background, we see a bare-breasted Patty Hearst as Tanya wearing the same prayer beads that Martin painted more than 20 years earlier. She is protected by seven naga with an inscription overhead of a question that was actually uttered by Hearst at her own trial. Did I ever really have a chance? Martin had first proposed some variant of this image for a mural at an AIDS center in New York, but it was, of course, rejected. But he wanted to paint it and worked on it just before he died. Martin phoned me while he was working on this painting, and it turned out to be our last conversation before his death. This year, 2017, also marks the 50th anniversary of the Hindu Festival of Chariots in Golden Gate Park, and Martin photographed its juggernaut since its earliest iterations you see on the lower right. These images suggest the diversity and range of Martin's engagement with Asian and Asian American culture. But Martin was especially interested to document his memories of growing up within the milieu of an American Chinatown. His mother had reportedly met her second husband, Martin's stepdad, at the Chinese laundry that was downstairs from their Union Street apartment. The Berkeley exhibition marks the first time this painting of his parents in the laundry has ever been publicly exhibited. Martin's Chinatown paintings have never been much critically appreciated. They are often dismissed as kitschy and less powerful than his other work. Today, Stanford professor of art history and Asian American specialist Marcy Kwan will talk about these underappreciated Chinatown paintings. Professor Kwan also received her PhD from NYU. I first met Martin when I was teaching at Humboldt State, and we later reconnected when I was teaching at the Art Institute. 
Martin had once been hired to teach drawing at Humboldt, and he asked me to help him get a teaching job at the Art Institute so he could return to San Francisco to take advantage of AIDS medical services here, which were more advanced than those available in New York at that time. Although that never happened, he moved into his parents' home anyway as his health declined and told people that he had retired from painting. But he actually remained active making paintings of his mother's backyard cactus collection, which are stunning, and three of them are in the current exhibition, although I don't think any of these four are featured here as well as a series of figurative paintings that celebrated the hip hop and Puerto Rican cultures that he so loved in New York. We can only imagine what Martin would be saying today about the devastation in Puerto Rico following the recent hurricanes. Martin painted literally until the day he died in his parents' home. We are very lucky today that our final speaker will be filmmaker Charlie Ahern, whose renowned and inspiring visionary masterpiece, wild style, still gives us the most beautiful and important glimpse of the remarkable early flowering of hip hop in New York. Mr. Ahern is also an author and photographer and was a good friend of Martin Wong, and he will show us a clip from his documentary film that will introduce those of you who never met Martin to this remarkable artist, and will remind those of us who knew him of why we loved him. <laughs> In Peter Sheldahl's November 2015 review of the current exhibition written during its presentation at the Bronx Museum, Sheldahl compared Martin Wong's importance during the 1980s Lower East Side scene to that of Jean-Michel Basquiat and Keith Haring. Today's panel is a reminder that Martin Wong was also a major American artist, one of Asian ancestry from San Francisco. And that pantheon includes Don Kingman, Ruth Asawa, Teresa Hakyung Cha, Carlos Villa, and so many, many more. We are ground zero. Now I want to ask each of our four speakers to give their remarks. Uh, I will try to signal people, so if, excuse me, uh, when we reach about 15 minutes, uh, when, if our time starts to get short. And I'd like to ask people in the audience to hold your questions until the end of the program when we will have extended opportunity for discussion. So I'd like to say thank you very much. And first, I'd like to invite Sergio Bessa, our inspiring curator from the Bronx Museum, to speak to us. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for this very nice introduction. So, uh, as Mark uh, mentioned, um, my essay focused uh, pretty much on, um, I was very interested in, in um, uh, Martin having lived here in the Bay Area during the hippie era and then coming to New York at a very kind of different moment in history, post-Vietnam War, and New York is falling apart and, uh, and all that sort of uh, came about. So, but I was also very interested in his writing. But this whole area of the writing is still something very uh, new to me. And uh, this presentation will be pretty much kind of an exploration of, uh, of that. Um, So I'm just going to show, I begin to show some of the works. It's very um, interesting to see, um, to see this series of uh, uh, scrolls that he did in, uh, um, in the late 60s. So this series that I'm going to present here, it's part of the book that Mark uh, featured in the beginning. And uh, one thing that is remarkable about this uh, scroll is Th this this poems is just in terms of poetry itself. It's very interesting. I don't think they are um, a sort of mature works of poetry. I think we could consider like ju juvenilia, 
but you can already see the ambition of uh, Martin kind of um, uh, trying to create um, uh, a future for him as a poet. Uh, and also very interesting here, uh, he's using his, his use of the calligraphy. Um, so, uh, which is very kind of uh, unique at the time. I think it's something that maybe it's related to what's going on at the time with the, uh, the hippies interested in, in, uh, in, in craft and uh, sort of a, almost sort of a return to that kind of idea of the craft in the 19th century. A lot of interest in Victoriana. A lot of these poems, they're very kind of, uh, I think they're very influenced by, uh, I would say sort of a superficial reading of uh, William Blake with the nursery rhyme kind of uh, uh, rhyming. And then also some of the images, like some, there is a little bit of the, the attempt to be visionary, um, but it doesn't have that depth that you find in Blake and also some, some of the scary depth <laughs> in the sort of more prophetic works by Blake. <clears throat> but I'll just point out to some of uh, <coughs> the elements that um, we um, have in this poetry. Um, It's very hard for me to read my handwriting here this morning. But I will just point out to some of the images here in some of these poems. Uh, for example, the second line here says, through smoky dreams, shadows, swimming, wandering. So it's a little bit of uh, uh, maybe depiction of experiences that he's having. Uh, I believe he wrote some of these poems in Eureka. Uh, so there is a lot of dis, uh, description of uh, uh, nature, maybe descriptions of events, um, but also like this very kind of uh, almost psychedelic kind of tone to them, like waves of deep purple. Um, they speak in slow circles and uh, silent child eyes. So there is a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, poetic cliches. They still not sort of a very mature voice. Uh, here's another poem that, uh, again, the images come crystal morning, silver light. There is a lot of this kind of repetition of these, uh, 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 these, these, these images of vision um, uh, and a kind of virgin on the, the, the psychedelic. Blue children lingering darkly wave, uh, weave uh, shadows through the twilight. You don't see in these poems really like, um, let's say, the poet. Uh, it's almost like the poetic eye is a little bit kind of uh, obscured by this kind of uh, uh, overwhelming kind of uh, display of uh, beautiful images. Uh, but you, don't, you, you still don't see Martin in these poems. Um, and then you have this very one, this one that I think it's very interesting because in this one he kind of uh, uh, display a little bit more of himself as this young dude. Um, he's probably 19 or 20, or maybe 20, going to 21. And this one says, it's almost a pop poem. Super deluxe pizza with everything to go, all you could ever wish for and more, pepperoni, anchovies, onions, and groovy. So it's a very kind of a pop kind of iconography, very different of the other ones. But at the same time, at the end, you see that it's probably he was in a trip, in a LSD trip, not eating for a few days, and he's like feasting on this pizza with everything that he could put in that. Um, and then there is this very curious poet, 
poem that I actually had to copy because I didn't have a file for it. But I love in this poem here that, again, he still has that kind of nursery kind of rhyme element to it. But it, 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 has, a, it has a little bit of, uh, it previews a little bit his life in New York. So it's kind of nursery, but it's also like scary things, like a junkie, a junkie, a mainline junkie. He got his kicks from his fix till he OD'd on his mix. And then a hooker, a hooker, and he goes on and on. Uh, Kony was asking me um, in the galleries about a painting that has a huge valentine, and I couldn't say specifically what that painting was about, but you can see in this very early poem you know, he already kind of makes this reference to the Valentine. Um, so very kind of interesting poem. And then um, this is a phase that um, it's kind of hard for me to kind of say where he went from there, how many more scrolls he did. But this is a painting that I, I, I really wanted to include in the show because for me this is a transition from Eureka to New York. Um, and the, the painting is uh, dated from Eureka, so probably he painted there. But he has already some of the elements that he will use in his New York paintings. They are very dark, they have this kind of apocalyptic, visionary kind of uh, element to it. It has all that Himalayan kind of elements that Mark mentioned before. You see the skulls around and everything. But then there is the use of the text here is very interesting. He writes, tell my troubles to the eight ball. So it's a very kind of cryptic, it's very simple, and uh, the eight ball, of course, is, is just a game for kids. But you, you also see there is a little bit of a weight in this line because the image is so dramatic, this eight ball kind of uh, becoming a meteor, uh, meteor kind of uh, in the cosmos and kind of going somewhere you don't know. And uh, you just wonder, what the troubles are that Martin is going through um, at this point. Um, the other interesting thing that I find about this painting, and again I bring the, um, the, the reference to uh, Blake, uh, he's merging imagery and text, and this is what's gonna be part of his major work, and it's very different of the paintings that he did um, when he was living in the Bay Area. <coughs> And then in terms of his paintings and in terms of his writings, a major event happens when he meets uh, Miguel Pinheiro. Uh, Miguel was, basically he was a, a petty thief, a, a, a petty criminal. And he went to, um, to Sing Sing very, uh, very young and uh, he had no education. He was just a low side denizen. But in, um, in Sing Sing, he attended classes for acting. And in those classes, he actually found his poetic voice. And he became this amazing poet. It's very, very hard to read his poetry. And again, Connie and I were talking about today that she tried to see the film based on his uh, play, Short Eyes. And it's very hard because he was going through quite a lot. And, uh, he just could throw everything in his poetry. So this painting here is one of the first paintings that Martin actually um, celebrates his, let's say, um, relationship, mentorship relationship. I don't think they were even uh, uh, either a couple, ever, yeah, ever a couple. But um, Martin uh, celebrates his relationship with uh, uh, Miguel and on the top, it's a little bit hard to say, but on the top is a poem. He uh, writes a poem, one of the poems of uh, Pinheiro that it's very, very hard, and it's about his upbringing. Like he was born in, uh, in this very kind of harsh conditions. And I just think, um, looking at these paintings and then looking at Martin's early work, I think the impact of Pinheiro was to really push Martin to uh, cut all the flourish and kind of uh, talk about his life just 
uh, with no values. And I think from then on, that's what's going to happen in um, Martin's uh, work. So I have another painting here that it's around the same time. Uh, this painting was painted in 1984, but actually it's a little bit of a biographical painting that tells when Martin arrived in New York in 1978, and he lived in this uh, hotel room uh, close to the C Street, uh, um, South Street Seaport. And uh, he was basically confined to this one bedroom because um, according to interviews that he gave to uh, my co-curator, he didn't have any friends in New York. And he would try to go to clubs, but he was not allowed because he, he was Asian looking and he, uh, he was discriminated, he was not one of the cool kids. And he would just go back to his room and he would paint and paint and paint. So um, what's remarkable about this painting, and it's a pity that it was not possible to come to uh, Berkeley, is that um, this is, uh, you know, it's like, let's say, the first page in his biography in coming in New York. So he says that it was in this room that uh, the first paintings with the, um, this, the, this uh, American Sign Language were created. So he's kind of memorializing and he's kind of historicizing his development as an artist. Um, the painting, of course, is a reference to Van Gogh, famous uh, painting of his bedroom in, in Arles, but kind of seen from a different perspective. And the other thing also, I mean, there are many, many things here in this painting that it's very biographical. You see the books he was reading at the time. You see some of the paintings that he was doing at the times. Some of these paintings actually are on display at the gallery. Another painting that um, it's really uh, heartbreaking it's, and has so much to do. Uh, Mark mentioned that uh, Martin is not just an Asian American artist, but he's an American master. And he is an American master in the sense that he also embraced everything Americana. So this painting, in a sense, makes so many references to 19th century um, uh, painting and also embroidery uh, that kind of tells some kind of narrative and memorializes mostly uh, the passing of someone. Um, so this is the kind of uh, work that he's doing, and this is the kind of work that he's doing with his painting and also with his writing. And then things get even more personal, like in this little painting here, uh, that he actually addresses his desire. Uh, and there is a couple of things that uh, in the paintings that he, um, just a few things that he actually addresses that. So in this one, and it's wonderful because it's such a small painting, we see it so big, but he has this thing about the smell of man and uh, how he likes um, B.O. and you know how he wants to kind of uh, lose himself in that kind of atmosphere of working man and, and so forth. There is another work in the exhibition that it's just a scroll on a brown paper that he also references to smell of man and he, his kind of desire uh, on all that. Um, so the other thing that it's very important um, between the relationship between Pinheiro and Martin is how Pinheiro basically opened to Martin a whole new side of New York that he didn't know, <coughs> which is the, um, the Loy side. And the Deloitte side at the time is, um, it's a little bit like an enclave, uh, I would assume. I was not in New York at the time, but from what I read, um, it was an area that it was basically called Loisada, which is kind of a, uh, how the uh, Latino population called the Loisada, Loisada because it was basically uh, Latino uh, families living there. Uh, in the interview that we published in the catalog, there is a lot of stories about the people that he knew there, like kids that in the evening they would just go around the block assaulting people, getting money for their fix and so forth, or prostituting themselves. So the stories, they're really uh, harrowing from our perspective. 
But uh, Martin thrives in that. It's kind of a very Dickensian kind of uh, uh, atmosphere. Uh, all these lost boys, and uh, and and he's very happy in that. Uh, I think that also has to do with his um, own identification as a gay man uh, and this idea of being, uh, um, being closeted. Uh, and then some of these paintings of this period will actually have this kind of uh, uh, maybe a metaphor for living in a closet. And uh, the image is mostly uh, an image of prison. And uh, some of the stories that uh, Pinheiro would tell Martin or that he would write about in his uh, poems or in his uh, plays, uh, Martin would consume vividly so, or avidly. So this painting here is very interesting because it just looks like a very kind of urban scene. But if you see the walls, they circle around. And the city, in a sense, becomes a prison. Um, so this prison, the trope of the prison, is something that becomes very important in Martin. And it was something that was very well researched. So he actually collected several books about prison. It was like photographs of men in prison, photographs of Latino men in prison, photographs of uh, prison systems. All these books, they are at the Fales Library, and it's an amazing trove. And we actually had an opportunity to show at uh, a concurrent exhibition uh, when we did that, uh, our exhibition at the Bronx Museum. Uh, a gallery in the Lower East Side showed just the material related to prison. Uh, but this, for example, is just a sketch. He did numerous sketches and studies of uh, circulations in prison. And here, we actually have a fantastic display of some of these prison paintings. Um, this one, for example, amazing because it's almost photographic. It's like very, um, you know, straightforward. But the only thing that it's odd here is that you have some flying sources <laughs> uh, on the top there. So, you know, he really never let, left the, the hippie persona. Uh, and then we, I'm very happy this painting came, Connie. This is such amazing. Uh, I think this was one of his masterpieces. Uh, so the, the man at the bottom, that's Miguel Pinheiro. And uh, Miguel, he was beginning to get a lot of attention. He got some prizes for his play, um, uh, Short Eyes. And then all of a sudden, he is being contacted by Hollywood uh, to do films. And he's in a film with uh, Paul Newman. He plays a little hustler in the film. And he comes to uh, Los Angeles to talk about some possibilities of contract. And that's when basically he and Martin, they never see them, each other again. And soon after he died. And this painting uh, memorializes uh, Pinheiro's life. And uh, uh, I believe on the top or on top of the wall, it, it says it, it has the, the uh, year of birth and year of death. and the. The beauty in there is Sing Sing. And he breaks this hole to show inside the life inside the prison. And then all the characters, they are characters in Pinheiro's um, uh, play. A couple of other images related to uh, prison. Prison is very idealized, right? I mean, we don't think of prison as like this almost um, Robert Ryman white minimalist setting, you know, uh, clean sheets. No, it's absolutely not that. But it's, it's all about, it's all for his erotic reverie, in a sense. Uh, or this one. Uh, it's a prison, but it could be a scene in a club. You know, I don't know if he went to some of those s and clubs in New York, which was very popular in the 80s, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and then there is this amazing painting. Um, it's so sacrilegious. It's, it's a little bit like a, a New York underground scene through the eyes of Jean Genet. Um, and it's a, the, the, the setting here is the Annunciation. 
So it's when the angel comes to tell Mary that she is pregnant with the baby Jesus, but this is in prison. And it's uh, an older man in love with a younger man. And the text is all in Spanish, and it's all copied from Pinheiro. So he is speaking, Martin is actually speaking through Pinheiro's voice. So very, very interesting thing. So this whole thing about uh, his relationship with writing with Pinheiro and his evolution from that kind of very hippie, visionary, uh, diffuse language to coming to this reminded me a lot of uh, uh, other writings, but or, or writers, um, but particularly um, this poet from Alexandrian, uh, Constantine Cavafy. And I just decided to include this poem here because it talks about walls. And uh, Cavafy, he was living in the beginning of the 20th century. And like um, Martin, he was this closeted gay man in love with a very young man. And in this poem, he talks about this idea of being surrounded by these walls and not uh, realizing that these walls were built around him. And I, as I was kind of preparing this show, I always thought about this poem because I think uh, Martin's work brings so much about that. And then I will just finish with a couple of other images. This is Miguel Pinheiro reading um, in, uh, in the Lower Side. And you see here, um, this is an image of apocalypse. The sky is red. It's again, it's very Blakean. It's very, um, it's very Dickensian in a sense. It's a, you know, a, a, it's a very kind of a tough uh, time. And then the last image that I want to show is this really beautiful uh, image of destruction and. Uh, the title of this is Everything Must Go, which is just a, a ready-made line that you take from uh, store sales. Uh, but you have this image of destruction of buildings collapsing in the lower side. But then you have this amazing view of the skies and constellations in the back. So thank you. I'd like to echo everyone's thanks um, to the museum for this exhibition, um, to Sherry and Sean for organizing the symposium, and uh, to everyone who came all the way from Palo Alto, <laughs> uh, and especially, obviously, uh, to Mark, who's been um, a really wonderful uh, resource and friend um, in my year since I've been here in the Bay Area, um, and hopefully a future collaborator. Dear Martin, I love you. Although we never met, I feel like I knew you. Maybe it's because your paintings are like bodies, the red acrylic of your bricks built up stroke by meticulous stroke until they feel like flesh. Standing in front of Big Heat from 1988, which I think is the first work by you I ever saw, although I can't really remember for sure, feels like standing in front of another person. Brick walls block, but here the ruined building quivers with the intensity of the gentle lip lock below, whose tenderness seems to emanate upward, staining the wall with romantic smudges of pastel paint. I love this painting, but for all its gentleness and idealism, its picturing of a gay fantasia on national themes, to steal a phrase from Tony Kushner, it's not why I love you. Rather, I love you because you understand that love is not all hearts and butterflies and pastel paint. Love is complicated, painful, and even violent. I think you loved the Angels of Light, Hibiscus's mystical queer performance troupe, and I think they loved you. You made remarkable things for them, as we've seen, um, such as the intricate set designs and costumes for parasites under the bourgeois sea and mything. The golden peaks and flowing black lines of your set reminds me of Five Dynasties landscape painting, 
whose calligraphic washes of paint express both the harmony of nature and the poetic refinement of the literati. Your set makes a gift of your own refinement and worldview, a backdrop for the antic actions and lavish costumes before it. The cock hats, forerunners to the angels of light, um, also loved China, as we've seen in Julia's presentation. Um, and as Julia Bryan Wilson has detailed in her, um, I think, frankly, field-changing book, Frey, the Cockettes staged a number of body productions, such as Peking on Acid and Pearls over Shanghai, that took aim at any form of political correctness or propriety, meaning they performed in yellowface. Composer Link Martin defended these productions by citing his childhood fascination with San Francisco Chinatown. But his Chinatown was not your Chinatown. His Chinatown was a place he occasionally visited to take in the exotic architecture, to eat a plate of chop suey at Charlie Lowe's, and maybe you also ate a plate of chop suey at Charlie Lowe's, but you lived just a few blocks away on Union Street above a Chinese laundry. Your Chinatown was the Chinatown of the 1850s, a place for newly arrived Chinese immigrants to congregate, eat, and shop. Yet even, as the 19, yet even in the 19th century, Chinatown was also a curiosity for those who lived outside of it. As historian Philip Choi has noted in his indispensable guide um, to the city's architecture, a number of wealthy Chinese merchants were already planning to transform Chinatown into a destination for exotic goods and sites at the time of the 1906 earthquake. The subsequent rebuilding of the quarter in a style that one might deem pagoda pastiche was due to their efforts, as well as the San Francisco Real Estate Board's recommendation that Chinatown be re rebuilt with, quote, fronts of oriental and artistic appearance. It was only by cladding itself in the curved eaves and bright paint, external signs of difference that signaled both economic power and a willingness to be consumed, that Chinatown could lay claim to the eight blocks which, had occupied, uh, which it had occupied for the past 50 years and prevent it being moved to the hinterlands of San Francisco, um, i.e. Bayshore. You love Chinatown both despite and because of the fraught history of its ornamental flourishes. Chinese Telephone Exchange from 1992 embraces these contradictions. The painting is organized like a postcard framed by the name and address um, and an inset with the exchange's pagoda pastiche exterior at the upper left corner um, and a dramatic central scene of the building's opulent interior, all shining wood and lattice scrolls below. The three women who sit at the switchboard seem to melt into the scene, the golden embroidery of their garments flowing into the trim around the switchboard, the thick ornament adorning the room's wooden panels and the dials of the two rotary telephones that frame the scene. These phones impart the painting with dramatic perspective while also thematizing um, its sense of connection. Indeed, it was the telephone operators themselves who were the main draws for the tourists um, to San Francisco Chinatown. As Choi recounts, by the 1930s, 24 operators handled upwards of 14,000 calls per day, which came at a rapid pace in multiple dialects of Cantonese. The room's adornment makes tangible this connection, golden filaments seeming to glow with the voices they carry. Despite your claims that you painted all of your San Francisco Chinatown paintings from memory, you never witnessed the scene. The Chinese telephone exchange closed in 1948 when you were just two years old. The painting is not a memory, but a work of historical imagination, a recasting of exoticizing ornament as a form of connection rather than alienation. I will never have full access to your Chinatown, not just because I'm of Korean descent, although that's a part of it. Rather, it's because this place, like any place, is defined by private spaces, tucked away from public entry and eyes. In a painting like Chinese Telephone Exchange or even your iconic My Secret World, I think you're telling me that exteriors cannot exist without interiors that they are connected much as the brick and windows in this painting are placed on the same plane. I realized just how much I would never see of Chinatown when I first encountered Frank Wong's remarkable dioramas at the Chinese Historical Society. Wong, no relation I think, um, although correct me if I'm wrong, um, 
also grew up in Chinatown and beginning in the 1990s created scenes of its public and private spaces um, whose miraculous intricacy is indebted to his experience as a Hollywood prop master. Like your paintings, Frank Wong's dioramas are based on memories on the Chinatown of his childhood of the 1940s. Christmas morning shows us the living room of a house during the holidays. The diorama is crammed full of telling details. The Christmas tree matted with ornaments gently sagging under its own weight. The Cantonese opera program whose cover announces the year of the scene, 1941. Uh, and an efflorescence of objects, including the golden scrolls, ink paintings, and a ceramic Buddha that, might be that all might be derided as orientalizing kitsch were one to see them on the shelves of Chinatown's many souvenir shops. You, Martin, had a number of similar Buddhas in your now legendary collection of 4,000 some odd things. These retowned laughing figures give the fantasy of Chinatown material form. Such, such objects migrate from public to private, interior to exterior, Chinatown to the city that surrounded it embodying the permeability of the membranes that would seem to separate these spaces. Despite the Cockettes' attempts to abstract China into fantasy, their show was also built on Chinatown's material legacy. As we've heard, and legend has it, the Cockettes got their start during a midnight repertory filming at the Pagoda Palace, a theater that opened in 1967 to show Chinese language films. Located in North Beach, just outside the, the official geographic boundaries of Chinatown, the theater was one of many venues that provided Chinese language entertainment to its denizens, beginning with the Cantonese opera houses of the 19th century. By the 1940s, when films based on Cantonese operas became more common, movie theaters also housed occasional opera performances, and opera houses began to show films. That the Pagoda Palace also hosted Cantonese opera performances, is evidenced by a lighthearted moment in the recent Coquettes documentary, when the members reminisce about sealing a trunk of opera costumes from the theater. Although presented as an irreverent prank, their loss was likely a huge blow for the performers who owned them, who relied upon these opulent costumes to create their characters and public identities. The uproar was such that the Coquettes had to pay the theater back for the lost costumes. I'm not sure what happened to these costumes, but I wonder if one of them ended up as the basis for one of the Angels of Light costumes. Um, no? Okay, good to know. Thank you for correcting me. I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Oh, great, okay. Wonderful, well, this is what I was hoping to find out when I came here. Um, so, even so, a Cantonese opera costume serves as the base of this, correct? Um, which uh, sequins, and fringe, and opaque tempera paint, and acid green, orange, and red have been applied on top of the cream silk. And the label actually in hippie modernism did label it as a Cantonese opera costume, but good to know, I intend to find out. Um, the four pennants bursting from the shoulders identify this as a nukau, or women's armor worn by female generals. Despite the vast chasm, um, of purpose and ideology that separates, separates the Cockettes from the angels. Their common use of Cantonese opera costumes suggests a possessive kind of love. They digested that which was other, bringing it into themselves and making it their own, a part of themselves. Um, on one hand, this was the source of their tremendous creative power. Um, but you, Martin, I think, had a different way of expressing your love. As you once wrote to Hara of the angels, quote, I love you, but I could never be a part of you. Your love eschewed possession and easy identification, acknowledging your apartness. For me, the most moving moment of the recent Cockettes documentary was seeing you in the background of Hibiscus's crucifixion, which marked your, uh, his, which was one of the performances that marked his departure from the group. Clad in denim, you stand back, loving through presence rather than possession. Even your kind of love, however, comes with the risk of mistranslation. 
Take your use of finger spelling, which you use to spell out all manner of phrases, including Starry Night, the title of this picture. Within deaf culture, finger spelling comprises a small part of ASL, a vibrant form that also incorporates movement and facial expressions into a language of enormous richness and complexity. Uh, for me, I understand your use of finger spelling as stemming from your fascination with the conjunction of image and language. Chinese character, graffiti, and constellations, you often layer these languages on top of each other, like a Rosetta Stone that extends from street to sky. And yet for someone nearly fluent in ASL and familiar with deaf culture, such as the art historian Kyle Metzger, who helped me think through many key aspects of this paper, your use of fingerspelling hews dangerously close to um, a kind of possession of deaf culture. Like the Cockats and the Angels, however, your engagement with deaf culture contained a material dimension. You found fingerspelling in the New York subway, purchasing a card featuring the alphabet from a man identifying himself as a deaf mute. Like the porcelain Buddha that sits on your shelf, these small slips of paper are deceptively simple. They're at once reductions of deaf culture and language, emblems of need, um, but also, at least in the case of the one you received, and in case of, I think, many of the examples that we've seen today, a gesture of connection. Martin, I have a story to tell you. Like you, I lived in California bef before moving to New York for over a decade. A few months before I was due to move back to California, I visited your retrospective at the Bronx Museum. In my 13 years in the city, I never once encountered anyone passing out those fingerspelling cards. But of course, on my way home from the museum, someone finally offered me one. Martin Baby, you and me were written in the stars. Thanks. Hello. Um, I want to thank uh, Sherry and Connie for inviting me here and um, allowing me to present um, a shortened version of this film to you. And I wanted to set it up a little bit. Um, it's so interesting to be um, in a room where identity is being dissected on so many levels because it's really just expresses a deeper mystery of who we are. Um, uh, the, Martin's time with the Cockettes was the early 70s and when I knew Martin in the early 80s he was not a Cockette. He was Martin Wong and he was very guarded about who he was around his friends who, um, and I'm not going to try to explain any of this because none of it makes any sense to me. I don't have the reasons why, but um, Martin loved to have friends around him. And one of the things he liked to do more than anything else besides paint was to go out and eat dinner. Um, he would like to go to a Chino, Malo, a Chino Latino restaurant with a group of friends, and these friends would often include Lee Quinones, um, John Ahern, um, myself, Days, Sharp, etc. You couldn't imagine a more heterosexual group of men. It was um, why would Martin surround himself with these straight guys who he fawned after and clearly was obsessed with and toyed with incessantly the, the, there was the subject of sexual joking at the table. So I'm not saying that this was, this was some kind of straight-laced Martin. Martin seemed to, um, in a certain way, flower in the company of straight men to be able to needle them about their sexuality. and. Um, I guess I better stop right there because I'm getting more and more into trouble here because I have no explanation for this, but it's part of the mystery of who Martin was and that um, the kissing fireman has become his um, icon after the, the um, Whitney Museum 
very um, importantly bought that painting and, and it became an icon for gay culture. But I have to say, I looked at it and I was like, of course we knew he loved and was obsessed with firemen, so it made sense. But Martin as an icon of gay culture, it was a little hard to understand exactly because this is not how he presented himself to the world. He was still Florence's son who was not ready to come out of the closet. That's how I saw it. And um, I think um, uh, I made uh, two films with Martin. I made one film uh, which was made before Martin became precipitously ill um, with uh, AIDS and had to go um, to leave his uh, apartment on Ridge Street. And what you're seeing and what most people now know of my film that I made with Martin sees these two contradictions as a single flowing energy. They were not like that in real life. In fact, I made a film which was basically about Martin's show at PPOW, which reflected his Chinese, his Chinese, Chinese-ness. Relax. We're among friends here. So, um, and that ended with this lovely dinner that he held in this very gangster um, place in Chinatown. That was the original ending of the film. And I sent it to Flo, to Florence. And she said, I like the film very much, but you may not call it The Clones of Bruce Lee. I thought that was funny because Martin thought it was funny. And funny was what Martin was most of the time. And I immediately said, of course you're right. It's going to be called Martin Wong because that's what it should be. And she nodded over the phone and that was that. Um, and that was the part one. Then um, there was a series of precipitous changes in Martin, his health, um, and he was in the hospital and I went to visit him. And I, I have to say, just to set this film up, and I'll try to be very brief here, that um, everything you see in the film was just as is. It's like film in real time. There's no, um, there's no collapsing, there's no editing to create something that's more than what it was. It's just the matter of, that's all it is, is a standing in front of something and letting the camera run itself for a brief amount of time, and then the next scene. That's all it is, and that's what Martin wanted. Um, and um, th that's what you're going to see, um, which is basically a, a record of certain moments of time. But it's profound, because I had been trying to get Martin to work with me, because I had been um, obsessed with trying to document some of my closest people who were artists. I did a movie with my twin brother, John, with my wife, Jane Dixon, and with Kiki Smith. Martin was obsessed with uh, Jane Dixon's work and with the film that I, more, more importantly, he said, I want a film just like the, the one you did with Jane. This was when he called me up. Uh, he called me up about nine o'clock in the morning and he said, you have to come over here I'm making an autobiographical movie and you have to, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, you must come over here, I'm making an autobiographical painting and I want you to document it. And honestly, in my own mind, it was like I just stepped through the door and there I am in a studio. In other words, it, it took me five minutes to get from my house with my camera to Martin's and everything that you see in the film to me just happened as quickly as un. Uh, taking the lens cap off the lens and pushing the button. That's all it was. Thank you. Oh, what do I do? What do I do?
get in? Does it stuff like this? Okay. <laughs> that was the gate unlocked or what? Yeah. You know what? San Francisco? Oh, yeah, the, most of all of these are San Francisco. This is Grand Avenue. Why San Francisco instead of like New York? Because that's where I grew up. I grew up in San Francisco, Chinatown. See, there's me right there <laughs> watching the parade. I think that I, I took him to 62. Yeah, see, this one that says February 62. That's one of the originals. Your head. The, these are all the lion dancers. Even the Chinatown book, the, you know, the investigative reporter wrote, she thought the lions were dragons, they're not. Oh, Kid, I was much smaller, so the dragons looked much bigger. That's the big dragon. See this guy? This is the dragon. See? <laughs> you know, I used to live with the Angels of Flight. That's where I really got into glitter and stuff like that. I was with this uh, guerrilla theater troupe. And, uh, uh, years later, you know, I come here and then I find out that uh, they were really influenced a lot in their early days from uh, uh, Charles Ludlum and the Ridiculous Theater, things like that. Uh, also, Joe Beck's Living Theater. And they were all influenced by Jack Smith. You know, like, I hear all these descriptions about the way Jack Smith lived and we were living, you know, that's how we were living with glitter everywhere. You know, just everything was just cardboard glitter and junk. A lot of the sh shamans were just basically deranged drag queens. You know, like visionaries or something. I met Miguel Pinheiro at the uh, ABC No Rio during the crime show opening and they thought it was be neat to have a real criminal so they had him do a poetry <laughs> reading. <laughs> he was famous in the neighborhood for in the 70s he wrote a, a famous prison drama named Short Eyes but after I got to know him he, he started staying over in my apartment because where he lived on 3rd Street it was got to be kind of wild. So sometimes he would just seek refuge in my apartment for a couple of days at a time. And the first time he came over, he brought these four teenagers. It was, uh, Pete and Marty, the twins, uh, Brian, and Pito, this kid he referred to as his son. But it was much later I came to the realization it wasn't really his son. <laughs> uh, somewhere along the line, we just decided to collaborate on a painting together. Uh, Pito was an upcoming graffiti artist and had written his name and uh, Mikey's all over uh, the Turning Street handball court. So Pinero wanted me to paint the handball court with the graffiti on it to kind of remember Pito by. And uh, so I, that was my first neighborhood scene. And then he wrote a poem for the sky. I was born in a barrel of butcher knives raised between two forty-fives on a Saturday night when the jungle was bright and the hustlers stalking their prey. And 
Later it got bought by the Metropolitan. It was my first sale out of a commercial gallery. When he left, he left all his manuscripts. I had two drawers full of his manuscripts. Is that what got you interested in doing these jail paintings? Yeah. He used to, sometimes we'd be together with his ex-con friends and I'd hear all these outrageous stories. One time they were bragging about how they gang raped a corrections officer in the 70s. I don't know whether to really believe the story or not or whether they were just trying to get me hot and bothered. <laughs> This is a panorama of our Eureka, California. I painted up there in 72. But what were you doing up there? Hanging out, being a hippie. <laughs> <laughs> I had a crush on other local fishermen. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be a marshal in the parade. He's going to videotape. Oh, you're going to be a marshal in the Chinese New, New Year, Year parade. parade? Great. Where is it? Uh, Chinatown. <laughs> Hello. Yes, I have a comment for Charlie, which is that you, in your introductions, you said you just were filming what's right in front of you, and you were very modest about how it was just kind of like there, it was all just, you know, as if you had almost no age, you know, that you were just kind of this passive um, receiver of, but in fact, you're doing such sophisticated work here with um, with time, you know, how, the, how temporality, you're collapsing time and space. I think it's just such a beautiful film and it has a lot to do with the decisions that you made about how you filmed it, the intimacy of the camera, the kind of lens that you used, um, how, the editing choices that you made. And I just, you know, I think I just wanted to say that it's clear to me that you had a vision there and that that vision is very strong um, and doesn't feel at all passive, but very active in shaping how that worked. So that's a compliment. <laughs> Thank you. That's very nice. It, it comes from a very deep well of um, recognition of being in the presence of uh, someone of enormous passion and uh, a recognition that you're in the presence of, of, of a great artist and it's time to listen. Um, 
and there's nothing that you can do to add to it. It's, it's what's important is just to be present, and, and so that's my answer to that. And um, um, I've got one. Yeah. And <laughs> I th uh, my question is, you know, I was rereading the Peter Sheldahl review of the, which is a rave review of the, of the current exhibition that we see. Uh, but in that review, uh, Sheldahl says that Martin's Chinatown paintings are clearly weaker uh, than the rest of his work, but that he returned to his greatness with the late paintings, uh, some of the figure paintings, and the cactus paintings. So uh, I guess my question is for Marcy, who spoke about these, um, do you you know how do, how do you see these in relationship to the rest of the work because they they always get kind of uh, criticized as being not as rich yeah I mean I think that um, it's probably pretty clear that I find them incredibly rich and generative um, because um, I think that you know one thing is that um, the as Sergio showed us the sources of the Pinero and the New York paintings um, uh, are so evident, they're almost kind of spelled out there. Um, and and I think that it's really easy, um, and I think that's something maybe of the kind of denigration of the paintings has to do with the denigration of Chinatown as not being serious or just being this kind of kitschy place um, that's just for touristic eyes, but I think that he saw something more complicated in them. Um, and so for me, um, uh, what's interesting to me about those paintings is that um, Actually, every place he's painting is not a fantasy. It has like an intense, an intense uh, specificity and inte like an intense awareness of the material histories of the places. You know, there's um, a place, uh, the um, the Harry Chong's laundry painting, which isn't in the show. I realized, you know, it's like on this corner, um, and he's painting with this kind of alienated figure behind glass. And I was like, oh, this was painted three blocks away from where um, like Nighthawks they say was painted. And so it's clearly in dialogue with, you know, the specificity of those places. So, so again, I think that it has something to do with like m the way in which we can or can't see um, the kind of richness of the place, of the place itself. Um, I, I think your question is really great. Um, and when we are uh, doing the selection of paintings for the show, uh, the discussion about, you know, that those paintings being weak came to the fore. And I was like, you know, uh, I don't understand those paintings yet. I need to look at them more. I mean, it's much easier for anyone that comes from our history to kind of make the, the readings of the bricks and this and that. So clearly those are difficult paintings. But I think it was very important to show. And then once we showed, it was amazing to see them every day and then have an opportunity to live with those paintings. And then you discover so much. So there is a couple of things in those paintings that I think I hope some scholars will come and will write more about that. Those are the only paintings that he shows himself as a kid, as you saw in your film. Uh, and that's not the only painting that has that. And then the other thing is the presence of women. You know, he was notoriously a painter of buff, straight man, as uh, Charlie said. But then in those paintings, the return of the female figure uh, appears. And, uh, and then the third thing that I think it's fantastic is the color blue. So there is a blue in those paintings that you don't see in the other paintings. A lot of the other paintings are like browns or uh, grays. Uh, but in those paintings, and it was very interesting at the Bronx Museum because you'd go in this kind of parkour, and when you'd get to the, the Chinese paintings, it became like this really rich blue, and it was really uh, fascinating, so. Um, the, the, I, I am not a, um, an expert on Chinese culture or um, and I don't want to go into whatever the arguments pro or con, except that from my perspective of being present when he was painting the series, and the fact that he asked me to 
document him is a very, very, it's a profound thought on his part that he wanted to re be remembered in this way. And that um, th there is a kind of hollow mirrors here in which there is a kind of um, facade of humor. This is, runs through American culture of like, you know, minst minstrelly or whatever. There's a kind of hall of mirrors where you're making fun of yourself to people that are not you, but you're also revealing things about yourself in stereotype. And, and um, he, was a very, he was very involved in black humor throughout all of his work and in person. And I think in the Chinese painting, I felt the very deep sense of both the most, you know, there he is showing his parents in it. Laundry, this is, it, in a way, his parents didn't work in a laundry. So, so there is both something self-deprecating about this sense of a joke of it, but then it's also about the stereotype and reading like, this is how people see Chinese people, like, that is non-Chinese people. Um, and so there is this mirror thing going on. Like when he was in this, when we were in Chinatown, he was very much not of Chinatown. And like when the guy comes in with the, the guy came in and did this lion dance in front of us and he tried to give the guy money and the guy was saying, no, you can't do it that way. You're doing it wrong, in other words. Um, he was very, um, aware of how he was not that at the same time he is. So isn't that what we're all going through? Aren't we all this? I mean, really? I mean, is there any place where you're finally what you present yourself to be? Or are you presenting yourself as a contradiction? Um, I, I think this is a very big discussion and uh, maybe Mark wants to move on, but um, I make the case that uh, we have to show more of the Chinese paintings. I think we have to do more work about that. I remember um, in New York, I, a colleague, uh, uh, a, a Swiss curator came, and he had seen the exhibition that Dan Cameron had done at the New Museum. And he said, you know, when I saw those paintings the first time, I hate them. And now I'm kind of seeing them in a different way. So, and I think that's kind of a, you know, you need to live more with those paintings to sort of figure out what it is. But I think what you're saying about stereotype, absolutely. Because it's almost like he's kind of uh, tapping into his identity in a way that um, he didn't have access to. You know, I mean, remember, he dressed like a dandy. He dressed like a British, you know, like with a three-piece suit and the, and a cowboy, and he, he had this Latino, he thought his father was Mexican, and he had all this kind of, uh, so talking about postmodernism, which is a term that I abhor, but I think this is, uh, you know, it's, it, I think it's an example of that. You know, sort of you lose your roots or whatever that means, and then you try to reconnect, and you reconnect through postcards, through, reproductions and through, you know, would you have anything to say? Um, well, I, have, I feel like this goes to a lot yeah. of the conversation because I definitely have something. Sure. To say. I mean, I guess I'll say that I um, have taught, I've taught the documentary of the Cockettes to my stu my Berkeley students, um, to undergraduates, and they us often cannot get over what one student called the kind of casual racism that they saw in evidence. Um, and I was trying, and I have tried to make the point that, first of all, we, th that was a different moment in time, the, you know, early 70s, and the things were just, things were different. Second, that if you're looking for purity, absolute purity, in you're gonna be disappointed always. You will just never find absolute perfect politics in anything, and that we have, you know, and that what they're modeling, in fact, like, is very complicated, but it is also, perhaps a very deeply beautiful vision of kind of identity slipped free from the realm of authenticity, you know, where you actually can dress up like a, 
you know, a flowing God with dildos sprouting out of your head and that that makes sense in some rubric and that that, you know, I mean, so I think I, I have just tried to impress upon them, you know, the revolutionary moment, first of all, that they were inhabiting, which we, we're now in a totally counter-revolutionary moment, so it's so hard to imagine. But the idea that, yes, enacting, you know, here we are and we are gonna play with each other and that play it has explosively political potential. And now that might seem very grating, you know, or offensive, and, and yes, yes, it, yeah, those things, they coexist, you know, and we have to just hold those contradictions in our mind at the same time. And so I think, you know, yeah, anyway, that's what I have to say there. No, thank you. Um, uh, so, so I guess that what I would say uh, to, this, to this kind of larger discussion is that, you know, is just to, uh, quote back something that Mark told me initially uh, in our like kind of first conversations about Martin, which is just that, you know, people often um, say that the work is self-orientalizing. Well, he would say, well, have you looked at Chinatown, right? <laughs> and and that to me is a really profound statement because I think that um, what might seem like um, a kind of distance or grappling with identity um, from one perspective, from another perspective is the position in which you're actually in. Um, I mean, you know, I talked with KK Young, um, who was incredibly generous with me um, with her time. With her time, um, uh, Martin's niece, and she was just like, "Yeah, like we just lived in Chinatown, and like Martin kind of identified it with kind kind of identified with it, kind of didn't. He like lived there, but he also like like went other places. And I just I feel like that's very much the experience of a minority a minoritarian position in the United States. And so it doesn't actually feel like some kind of um, postmodern necessarily play of identity but um, but to me feels like something um, uh, very distinct about um, about this question of you know constantly attempting to or feeling like um, one is in a position in relation to a mainstream and and you know I think it raises questions of like the the pleasure and pain of assimilation for example there isn't uh, and this is the last thing I mentioned this but uh, in those paintings, and I think uh, two paintings didn't make um, the way here, but he had this, uh, it's almost like he wants to go back to the roots of his families. So uh, there is a painting that it's called The Wong Family Benevolent Association. And so he made two paintings of the same thing. And it's, the, you know, the building is almost like a, kind of a Mexican colonial transformed into, you know, it's a very kind of postmodern kind of uh, architectural thing. And uh, one is a good size and then the other one is, is much bigger. But then he has this really beautiful painting that it's an airplane flying over Chinatown and you'll see the Wong Family Benevolent Association below. So, you know, he went three times kind of uh, investigating that. And by the way, the airplane is populated with kids. In each of the windows is like a, 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 uh, the face of a kid, so it's really childhood. It's like back to the family roots, and uh, and then the presence of the mother, or the aunt, or whatever. Um, but you know, there is like this very powerful female figures in, in some of those things. So. One thing that I am struck by is. The wonderful thing when an exhibition like this happens uh, is that we get to see pictures we've never seen before. So out there today, there were some pictures I had never seen before, and I thought I had seen most of them. Uh, but there are those pictures that I am still hoping will surface that have disappeared in, uh, we, see, we know them from photographs uh, that Martin made because Martin was unbelievably hardworking, and there is so much work but I don't know where a lot of it is anymore. And f one of the things that I'm also happy about today is that we had this opportunity, and I hope they turn up, but we had this opportunity to talk about the Angels of Light. And there is the Coquettes film, but the Angels of Light film has been stalled. I'm not sure where it is at present, uh, but I wanna thank Julia for her research and also to recognize that uh, people from the Angels are here uh, because it's such an important part of our Bay Area art history and identity. Uh, and it is sadly under studied and recognized. So Martin's work is in the house, but the angel's work, we still uh, need to double down to um, help 
bring greater attention. Is there any questions from the audience? Because our time is starting to get short. Yep. Yep. I'm uh, touched and um, grateful for uh, the fact that people are finding Martin, but um, there are people who knew Martin quite well. Uh, two of us were in Parasites and Peking on Acid. Um, the details are not that important, but they still perhaps should be pointed out. Martin didn't do very much work with the Cockettes. He did much more work with the Angels of Light. In combining the two, it's important, but at this point in juncture in the discussion of this history, I think it's important to also delineate the two factions. The Angels had a philosophical um, belief in a larger society and lived outside of what was termed straight culture. Um, one of the things I just feel important to interject here in order to understand maybe something that isn't part of the dialogue mod in modern terms is that camp was an essential part of us becoming who we were and when we were young coming out and accepting the fact that we were gay. I never knew Martin as someone in the closet and he never knew us or came to us as someone in the closet. He came to us as another gay young person. And we, in order to create a connection, found most of the outside society camp worthy. Everything was valid for camp ridicule. <laughs> Cultures, stereotypes, commercials, hamburgers, hippies. <laughs> That thread um, is something that's really very touching and endearing about Martin's work in a sense where I don't think you have to make it very complicated. The pictures of Chinatown are resonant on a lot of levels, but they are camp. Bruce Lee is camp. The prison pictures, there's a degree of camp in the shape of somebody's booty when he paints it. The lust that he has in most of those pictures is palpable. And that is part of being a gay man in touch with this explosion of coming to terms with that in a revolutionary context and finding a community as well. Um, it was confusing for him and it was actually mentally um, challenging on a lot of levels. But I think, again, in the dialogue, it's really important to understand that there was a zeitgeist at the time. There was a communication of almost, there was a language that wasn't spoken. It was the knowing. And that's kind of what camp is. That's kind of what you see when you see a drag queen roll their eyes. Or when you see a drag queen just impersonating what we could take offense of as a female, but at the same time, what role are they really um, poking fun at or enjoying or exploring? It's a kind of a camp sensibility that I think we, we do need to remember. Total, yeah. I just couldn't agree with you more in camp. It's hugely important, so thank you very much for those comments. And I would also like to really <laughs> remind you that the angels were the um, the exist in a parallel universe. Thank you, Lord You got it. What's happening with the Angels movie?
touch with Mary Jordan, and it is fraught with um, delays and, and a lot of lack of agreement amongst people. It's a collective. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're all troubled. Yeah, he, had, he, had put, he had footage that uh, I can't even describe. Yeah. It's, it's indescribable. Compared to the Cockhead movie, forget it. Thank you, Mel. I was in the Cockhead movie. A little bit of the angel. And, and, and I just want to say thank you for coming and for, you know, um, contributing your knowledge to this forum and um, for that really lovely um, uh, exegesis on what it actually felt like to be there. So thank you. Any other questions, comments? Yes. probably hear me anyway, who had a great party. They all came up together to see the show. And I just think it was an example of how loved he was. And, you know, you'd think looking at his show, if you didn't know him, that he was a thug, a street person, or whatever, because of his imagery. He was one of the sweetest men I've ever known. And I just think that needs to be said. Thank you. First of all, um, Martin and I met in 1966 in September. He did go to school here for a year and a half, so he was closer to being correct when he wrote that consomme resume. Um, and Charlie's comment about having a lot of straight men friends around him is because he could get a bigger and better rise out of them than gay men. Very dependable. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. The question is, uh, do any of the sets uh, paintings exist? And there is one painting of a I think it's a study for a uh, headgear piece, and uh, it was in the basement at Ewing Terrace for many years, uh, framed, and then recently I saw uh, there was an auction of Martin's work in New York, and one of his humble period paintings made a painting of the set headpiece, costume piece. Uh, so.
right? Not much less. You have some, some people have some costumes, some people have certain small elements of some theater pieces from the Middle Ages. Do you remind me that Martin, when he was interviewed after he moved to New York, they asked him to speak about his work in California, and he said it was much more melty. <laughs> Any, all right, so uh, we're going to say thank you, everybody, for coming. Obviously, we really appreciate the participation of our spectacular panelists. I hope they will be able to write things up so that more scholarship will be published about Martin and the period. And we also thank this spectacular audience for coming and contributing, helping s correct the errors of our presentations. Thank you very much, uh, and enjoy the show. And tell your friends to please come and see it. <laughs>